Greetings, Earth Scientist. We are here today to learn about landscapes and geomorphology. First of all, geomorphology is the study of the shapes and landforms on Earth. That would be a really good test question. So right now you're looking at Mount Rainier from my sabbatical and um, I'm in the river basin that's glaciated runoff from this mountain right here and really it's a volcano. This sits about an hour and a half to two hours uh, directly away from uh, Seattle. So if it were to erupt, this could cause absolutely devastating consequences. So going back to that definition of the geomorphology, we actually are studying as earth scientists the processes by which specific types of landforms are made and the shapes of these landforms on earth. This is a tectonic map showing you where the most active mountain ranges are in red. They are all related to a form of um, plate collisions or in some cases even rifting, which is something along this side of Africa, for example, or right up here in Iceland where you see some red, where the continental crust is pulling apart. We learned about that in plate tectonics. So I want to tell you that every one of these red areas you see around the globe has a reason why it's red. And it's not that it's hot. In some cases it could be in terms of magmatic material under the surface. It's because this is areas that have been uh, uplifted and have mountains. And these uh, mountains or features or plains or whatever may be there are the direct result of having some kind of plate collision or plate tectonic story like rifting. So there are three major types of landforms. There are plains, plateaus, and mountains. While that may seem elementary, it's really not because your plains are fairly flat areas. Like down here, you could call this part a plain, but this is clearly a mountain, and this is uh, the Teton Range in Wyoming. Plateaus are something different, and we'll get to them in a minute. So let's start with plains, because they're the easiest one for you to, to relate to here in Texas. Plains are relatively flat, large areas, and uh, there can be coastal plains, interior plains. Uh, you're probably more familiar with interior plains, considering if you've driven in West Texas, you've seen uh, what we call the plain states, which is areas like Lubbock. And that would be very flat areas that are covered with grass and trees, and we even have some of those plains near Waco. This is a coastal plain along the Oregon uh, coastline that I drove this summer. And I want you to notice that you have hilly topography. No way would this qualify as a mountain. A mountain must have an, a vertical uplift of at least 900 feet or more. So this doesn't, I mean, it's just pretty flat land with some ro rolling topography. And this would be your typical coastal plain. Here's another coastal plain from Australia. I went there a few years ago, and this is uh, on the west side of Australia in uh, Monkey Maya. And uh, Monkey Maya is an area that's known for stromatolites. Well, this area is coastal plains, very flat. You can see the vegetation along the shoreline. And this is an, an area where you would expect to see plains. This is a river plain, and uh, rivers will make large, broad, flat plains that can flood every so often, and I'll show you how I know this is flooding. If you look over here, you can actually see where the tributaries will br uh, branch off. This is actually a braided stream from melting glaciers in and around the um, Southern Alps, which is in New Zealand. So I took this uh, in an airplane crossing over this area when I went to New Zealand and um, can tell you that you can see where the water has come and jumped the banks and put some pretty fertile soil on this side of the river. These river plains are very important to changing the landscape where we live. For example, the Brazos River where it is around where we are today hasn't always been in that precise location. It's meandered over time, and so we can find its river deposits to tell us exactly where it has meandered from. These are desert plains. So this summer I went to uh, out in uh, Arizona, in California, in Nevada, and I went to go see uh, areas that were places I hadn't been to start with 
Death Valley National Park. Well, this is not Death Valley. It was on our way to that location. And this was a great example of the Sonoran Desert Plains. You can just see a little bit of rolling topography in the back, some vegetation that's desert vegetation. But this is classic desert type plains. So what are plateaus? Plateaus are uplifted flat areas, usually regional in topography. When I mean regional, you're looking at tens of miles, not a feature that might be a mile long. However, those may be labeled on a map as a plateau. Truly, plateaus are near, made of nearly, keywords here, horizontal rocks that have been uplifted by earth processes, usually from some kind of catastrophic plate collision or magmatic uplift of a region. They differ from plains because they rise abruptly from their surroundings. And the best example I can give you is this place right here called the Colorado Plateau. And the background is parts of the Colorado Plateau, such as the Grand Canyon. We have a plateau right here in Texas. As a matter of fact, if you've ever been to the hill country, the reason that it's the hill country is because it's been uplifted, this whole limestone block called the Edwards Plateau. So this is a classic view of our plateau region, and it's been uplifted from its original position where it was made. Here's another plateau. This one is a coastal plateau in Australia. Uh, we were taking a boat tour when I went here in the uh, Sydney Bay, where you would expect to see the Opera House. That's where this is located, is in that bay. So if you ever go there, this should be one of your must-do things to take a harbor tour. And the harbor tour usually lasts about two hours. And all the way around the surrounding portions of Harbor Bay is this big, giant coastal plateau made out of sandstone, which is an indication of how this region sits upwards. I mean, it, it's actually been uplifted, but not uplifted per se uh, necessarily from plate tectonics as much as it has been from deposition. This is the best example of a plateau that I can give you. It's the Grand Canyon. And you need to assume and realize that the Grand Canyon extends for over 273 miles, uh, a little bit more than that, actually. And it's anywhere from 10 to 17 miles wide. And when you think about the plateau region, it's not just the Grand Canyon. You're looking at the entire Colorado Plateau, which includes parts of Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. It is a very large area. So when you're talking about plateaus, I want you to think regional big areas, not small flat features. Here's another plateau. While this is not the plateau, the entire thing that you're seeing in the background is. This is just a cinder cone volcano that sits on top of the Grand Canyon. You're like, I didn't know that existed. On the far west side of the Grand Canyon are a couple of volcanoes that have put in lava flows into the canyon. That's a different story for a different day. But nevertheless, the big flat feature you see way up here, this is the plateau, this entire region right in here. Looking at the Colorado Plateau, uh, plateau from an airplane, this is what it would look like. This is actually the Grand Canyon right in here. And you can see the rivers cut through this really flat, tall area. The whole area has been uplifted. And that's happened over a period of about five to six million years that this down cutting of the river has occurred. Well, the plateau has been in, was uplifted literally uh, about 15 to 20 million years ago. So once it uplifted and it tilted, rivers could begin to flow downstream. And that's how this down cutting occurred. So we're going to look at mountains, and mountains are those tallest structures on earth that are above sea level. I'd like to take a minute to talk about total relief and total elevation. This will be a test question, so you had to watch the video to get this information. A, an elevation, total elevation, if my, my marker right here at my neck represents sea level, everything beneath me from my neck down to my feet would be below sea level. 
everything above would be sea level, above sea level. So let's just say the top of Mount Everest is up here, but it doesn't start till my chin. That's kind of the situation for Mount Everest. It's total relief would be from my chin to up here. That's called total elevation. But from here down to my feet would be total relief. This is not the largest total relief structure on the earth. Those are found in the ocean basins and they are volcanoes that grow up from the bottom of the ocean floor like Mauna Loa. That one's 56,000 feet big. Now when you look at Mount Everest, it's a little over 29,000 feet tall. So that's an impressive size for vertical total relief. So there are different types of mountains. They each have their own characteristics and we're going to talk a little bit about how they were made. Folded mountains happen when you get some kind of compression of a plate against our plate. Typically, these can be formed in both subduction uh, situations that we learned about in plate tectonics and continent-to-continent -continent collisions. So folded mountains must involve compression. That would be a good test question. So essentially, they look like a rug that's been pushed against a wall. So if you can imagine you've got a rug that's rumpled up, that would be a good view of what that would look like in terms of, fall, uh, of creating folded mountains. There's a couple of really famous folded mountains in North America with the Appalachians having some of the greatest folds that we can see across our nation. Here are some examples of folds. Folds come in three different types. They come in anticlines, synclines, and monoclines. So I'm going to show you an anticline first. Notice that the fold has been bent upwards like an arch. That's an anticline. Over here, do you see how they are bent upwards like this? So in other words, the, the fold sinks down. If you put two eyes, one here and one here, it'd be smiling back at you. That's how I remember synclines is S for smile. That would be a syncline. If it only bends in one direction, we call that a um, monocline. So all three of these are fairly common, but the key message here is that they must all be formed by some type of compression. So anticlines would be this one, where you have it making an arch. Synclines would be the sinking smile. And then the one direction bending is going to be called a monocline. So all folded mountains have a specific look on a topographic map. We'll be talking about them in part two of this lecture. But topographic maps show you the elevation and see how these rock layers have been folded. You can see that in this diagram where you follow the contour markers and they, they make these V shapes. Well, that's because the rocks have been folded from compression. Here's a great look of the Canadian Rockies. I went to uh, Waterton, which is the northern part of Glacier National Park on my sabbatical and this was one of those areas that was a surprise because the Canadian Rockies are heavily folded from compression and so when I got there I was like wow you can see all this folding and, and bending of the rock here that occurred and so the Canadian Rockies are just uh, literally about oh, 10 or 15 miles north of the border from uh, Glacier National Park in Montana into Canada and so it's all the same mountains, they're all part of the Rockies, and they have been severely folded from compression. So what are upwarped or dome mountains? These are areas where you've got some kind of magma intrusion that got pushed upwards from inside the earth, typically from a large magma chamber known as a batholith. Usually these types of mountains are pretty durable because they contain granite and metamorphic rocks, igneous rocks. For example, you're looking at Mount Rushmore. While Mount Rushmore is famous for the four presidents, it's made up of, an, of a dome mountain. Uh, and this is all igneous rock that was formed back in the Precambrian Eon. So you're looking at some very durable rock, which is interesting that they would have uh, carved these faces into some pretty, pretty tough rock. Good for the longevity of Mount Rushmore, hard on the persons that had to do the carving. This is another shot of the Black Hills. If you're traveling out by Mount Rushmore, you'll go through an area called Needles Highway. This is right where this is. Beautiful section. You might, have, and you might recognize this from National Treasure Book of, Se of Secrets. And uh, this was actually where they were filming uh, towards the end of the uh, movie where they were looking for uh, 
Cibola, the city of gold. So that might look familiar to you. This is all upwarped mountains and dome mountains. So very, very common type of mountain that we have wherever we've had magma chambers push up stuff to the surface. Now fault block mountains are very common as well. This is where you get huge uh, tilted blocks of rock separated from the surrounding rock terrain by faults. And faults are where you've got rocks that have moved one direction or another or sideways relative to the, uh, to the rock next door. So when you get a fault, this crack in the rock, there has to be movement. If not, you'd simply have a joint. And faults are uh, play a role in where we have earthquakes, instability of rock faces, mass wasting. So they're a key part of what we look at when we're building structures and figuring out where people are going to live. So when one block of rock is pushed up while another is pushed down or vice versa, this can cause some very unique things to occur with mountains. So essentially what could happen is I could have, if this is my phone and my hands are another rock block, my phone could get shoved up or it could get shoved down. And so I'll get an alternating look of up and down, up and down, up and down. This is very common in several of our uh, mountain ranges around the, the United States. The Sierra Nevadas would be one, the Rockies would be one. So in this case, what has happened, you get one, um, one block of rock and in order to figure out what kind of fault it is, you need to take physical. I can tell you one-on-one -on -one if you want to call me and I, I can explain how you can figure it out if this is a normal or reverse fault. But looking at this, this appears to be um, a normal fault where the head wall, the side right here, has slipped in relationship to the foot wall. And what's occurred is um, we've had some kind of pulling apart of this area. In this case, um, you can see that the fault block that's fallen down here it's left a mountain exposed right in this area right here. So that's a classic fault block mountain. Here are some fault block mountains. This is actually in Oregon, and you can see uh, where they've been faulted, and you've got a big section of it that's been exposed because of a, a drop or an uplift in one area. These are classic fault block mountains. These are the Grand Teton National Range, and uh, you can totally see where a whole section in this case, a block fell and made a valley floor and left the mountains behind. The Rocky Mountains are a classic case of fault blocking. You can really see that well here where you see a mountain here, here, and here. And in between it, you see a low area. Well, that's characteristic of fault blocks. So let's talk a little bit about volcanic mountains. Volcanic mountains occur when magma reaches the surface, usually via subduction. Not always. They can happen from where a magma chamber sits under a continental crust like at Yellowstone. But most volcanic mountains are created via uh, subduction where you get an ocean plate that sinks beneath the continent. It heats up, makes magma chambers like a lava tube or a lava lamp, and they rise up to the surface and cook the crust essentially from the inside towards the outside. When this happens, you'll get one layer after another of a volcanic eruption until you just start developing this type of feature right here. This is actually the Mount Hood area. In um, When I went on my sabbatical, I got to travel through this section of Oregon. And it was fascinating because it, these were beautiful subduction uh, volcanoes. This is San Francisco Peaks in Arizona. Well, you don't think about Arizona having big volcanoes, but this used to be comparable to the volcano you just saw for Mount Hood. You're like, well, where did it go? <laughs> Why does it look that way today? It blew apart at the seams. So this is a composite volcano, just like this one is right back here. And it has uh, been blown apart. So that means somewhere in geologic past, Arizona had a subduction zone to create this type of phenomena. This is not a subduction volcano. This is called a, a, cone, a cinder cone volcano. This is Sunset Crater in Arizona, and it's a place that is uh, on your way to the south rim of the Grand Canyon if you're making that trip, and it's worth just a, a half day to stop and take a look, some good hiking there. But this is a smaller volcano, your typical uh, conical shape for a volcano. And even though um, it may look big, it's nothing in comparison to the size of those composite volcanoes that are called subduction volcanoes. 
Here's another subduction volcano. Uh, this was one I saw on my sabbatical called Mount Shasta. Notice that there's a whole bunch of glaciated tops in, at the very summit of the mountain. Notice that it's very angular. It, it just looks more majestic than this. No offense to a cinder cone volcano, but these are the granddaddies of volcanoes in terms of being uh, very explosive and uh, being very beautiful because they tend to make very tall elevation mountains and they tend to uh, end up having lots of snow coverage on them and ice fields. This is also a subduction volcano known as Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is in Washington State and it's another good, it's about two hours also from um, Seattle, maybe two and a half to three, but it isn't very far from Mount Rainier. And all of those mountains um, are related to uh, the subduction zone of the Cascadia Range, which is caused by Juan de Fuca plate subducting under the North American plate at Washington State and Oregon State in Northern California. So you have to imagine that this volcano looked just like that before it erupted in 1980. And when it erupted on May 18th of 1980, it literally blew out this flank right here, which is the north flank. And it totally uh, created a massive lahar. That's all this stuff you see right here, all this sediment, and a just gigantic pyroclastic flow. So I'd like you to take a minute and realize this used to be a really dense old growth forest. It's not there anymore. <laughs> the trees are still there, but they're buried in the lahar and the pyroclastic flow. So it basically snapped them off upon impact. So Mount St. Helens is a story of why we need to be careful around structures of these beautiful mountains. While they may be gorgeous and incredible places to live, they're not without their dangers. So we're going to look at a couple of special landforms, and first one is a mesa. Now this may look like a plateau, but keep in mind, mesas are much smaller features. Plateaus are regional features. So whenever you have a mesa, you have a flat top structure like this right here. And a mesa means tabletop in Spanish. So that's what you've got here is a tabletop feature. So it should be flat and broad. You know, it'll still be steep on the sides, but it's going to be broad and flat. That key part is broad and flat. This is a butte. While it may look like a mesa, check out the top of it. This one's out of Sedona, Arizona. And notice that it has an irregular top and that it's not nearly as broad. It's much skinnier and it has a bumpy top. So that's what a butte is. It's still very vertical, but much thinner and has an irregular top. That's how you know you're looking at a butte. Another special landform is this. This is called a hoodoo. So let's first look at what the hoodoos are and I'll kind of explain how they form. This will be some good test questions right here. First of all, I kind of want you to see these linear features where I'm kind of moving the mouse. Here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one going a different direction. These are called fins, like the fins of a, uh, a fish, F-I-N-S. And what happens is you get faults and fractures in bedrock. In this case, this is the Claron formation. And what will happen is you'll get rainwater that comes through because this area sits at about 9,000 feet in elevation. Think about that for a minute, 9,000 feet in elevation. This is in Utah. And uh, so that's pretty high up in elevation. And it should get around freezing at least half of the nights of the year, if not more, closer to three-fourths of the nights of the year. So it gets quite a bit of precipitation, even though it's in the desert, and that precipitation can come from groundwater. Uh, discharge. It can come from rain. It can come from snow. So they'll get in the joints, which are fractures and rock, and when it freezes, it expands and busts open the structure. Now the reason you got these pillar-looking st structures like these, which are called hoodoos, is because the rock on top has a cap rock. So I'm going to give you a visual for a cap rock. I'd like you to think about going to Three Spoons or, um, oh, the other yogurt place, my favorite one. I'm just drawing a blank. Um, Use Roll. And I think 
you get there and you can go through and get all your toppings and then you can take the toppings and one of them can be the squeeze, squeeze stuff that you squeeze on top and it can make a hard coating like of caramel. So I'd like you to think about putting that on top of your yogurt the next time you're in there and see what I'm talking about. It makes a cap rock. It hardens. So it's harder than the ice cream underneath it or the yogurt. So what happens in nature is you have to assume that the caramel coating would be this stuff up here and the softer ice cream would be down here. So this stuff weathers faster than the cap rock. So once the cap rock is gone, these things will tumble down and they'll no longer be a hoodoo. They may be a spire for a while, S-P-I-R-E, but they're not going to be a hoodoo unless they have that cap rock at top. So I guarantee you that's a test question about understanding how a hoodoo forms. This is a caldera. A caldera is where a volcano, you have to imagine a volcano, and I know you see a volcano here. That's a resurgent newer activity within this caldera. But I'd like you to look at the large circular rim and imagine that used to be a giant volcano. And so this thing, Mount Mazama, actually erupted about 7,700 years ago. And when it did, it looked much like Mount St. Helens, Mount Shasta, Mount Hood that I showed you. It's in the ba basic same vicinity. And so when this thing blew, it literally blew its stack off and it emptied out its batholith, which is its magma chamber, because of how explosive and fast the eruption occurred. So what ended up happening was you get this magma chamber and it empties out too fast, the weight above it can't be held, and it collapses. So all a caldera is is where the top wall of a magma chamber has fallen. And so if it starts to regrow again, it can resurge and those become very dangerous features volcanically. So this is called Wizard Island, and Wizard Island is actually a new volcano that's formed inside of the caldera. By the way, this is the deepest freshwater lake in the United States, as an FYI, and the beautiful color comes from the depth, because the only color that you can see is the reflection of blue. Everything else is absorbed. But if you look at the rim, you can see the big circular feature, and then you can begin to imagine that used to be the volcano. I mean, it is. It's you're thinking about a, a pointed volcano. Well, this would be the inside of that volcano looking in where the whole thing collapsed. So I'm going to take a break here and we'll come back in a few minutes and we will do part two of geomorphology and landscapes. And I'm going to tell you this is Yosemite Valley. I'd like you to do a Google search on Yosemite Valley and find out how it was made before we start part two. See you in a minute. Bye.